Welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games, a podcast in which we talk about board games. My name's Mike Walker, and I'm here with my good friend... Mark Pigney. And, Mark, I just got a notice from the the Board Game Podcast Association. Oh, yeah. And they said because we're at our one-year point that we now have permission to uh, add in the year in review. So we have to talk about the the game that we reviewed a year ago. Okay. Some people might say that how can this be a year since it's only episode 45? And if it was a year, we'd have 52 episodes. To those people, I'd say that we live in Canada and we go by a metric calendar. So that's why it's a little we invented, skewed. Yeah, we invented standard time and we gave that gift to the world. People should just deal with it. So one year ago, Mark, we talked about Kingdom Death Monster. And we haven't really gone back to Kingdom Death Monster due to the fact that we no. really don't feel like doing busy work at the moment. Well, you're saying we being very charitable. Let, let's, uh... Well, it's not as though I do. And charitable to myself, of course. <laughs> yeah. Here, 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 here's the sad story of Kingdom Death Monster. So we had a four-player campaign going, the two of us and uh, two other yokels. Let's call them uh, Huey and Dewey. And... Everyone, there's a fair amount of enthusiasm, even for me, for revisiting the campaign. And we stand by everything we said about Kingdom Death. The problem is, shortly after starting the podcast, my life blew up uh, because we bought our first home and there was moving involved. And I fall to pieces whenever moving is involved. And because we don't bore you with intimate details of our uh, private lives, we didn't go over all the various things that were happening to me over the course of things. Because, quite frankly, even I'm bored of my own complaints and you don't care and I don't care when other people talk about it. So I didn't want to inflict that on any of you. When I was finally in a position where everyone was in my home and, and, and it seemed like it was it was a plausible thing, and it was a, can we try some Kingdom Death? I'm like, oh, okay, fine. And so I bring out the box, and sure enough, all the components had been spread about like crazy. So I had to resort everything. And that, in turn, killed my enthusiasm for going back to paperwork. I have not been in a headspace to do paperwork for fun for a solid year. Although, maybe in the near future, I might be willing to return to it. So that's what we talked about last year. For the rest of the show, since it's a year, we're going to change it all up. We talked about, Mark and I, reorganized the whole thing since now we have to input this new segment into the show. So first we're going to talk about games we played this week, then news and why it doesn't matter, our feature game of the week, which is claustrophobia, new or old, whichever, and then the topic of the week is Keyforge grand new game by Fantasy Flight Games. We're going to talk about what we think about it, our first impressions, and I think just the whole concept of what Keyforge means to our industry. So, Mark, what did you play this week? Played some more Paper Tales. I bring this up for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it is is indeed steadily growing on me. It has a number of those characteristics that you really want in a game of its length and depth. Namely, setup is super quick, rules explanation is super quick, And unlike a lot of other games of similar complexity, you don't hear a lot of questions pop up. Despite the fact that there's a host of unique cards in Paper Tales, which is a drafting game that I've talked about a a fair bit before. And I thought that the iconography was going to be daunting, but honestly, I've had great success introducing it to people. And it's not that I didn't think that they they would understand it. It's that I I would expect the sort of normal rules questions that would pop up. Okay, how does this card work? How does this card work? But very frequently, I can sit down with a table of five other new players, explain the rules in about five minutes, and then I then receive practically no rules questions over the course of the game, which is really, I think, a testament to how well it's done. This is even in contradistinction to other the other light drafting game that that Walker and I both love, which is to say, Fairy Tale, where you still have questions about how various cards work, and part of that is just the iconography, but part of it is just that some of the cards card interactions are not immediately transparent. All of that having been said. Y- I I, I, wanted, I brought this up in part because I wanted to ask you, last time we played Paper Tales, I think you were at the table, you did not seem to be feeling it at all. Oh, I do have Paper Tales down here, and it's only, I think I'm just done with it. Okay. I'm done with Paper Tales. Yeah. And there's no particular reason, no, there's no rule, you know, nothing wrong with the game. It's just not for me. I just don't feel like in, in Fairy Tale where you can, where you can hate draft or... You know, there's all sort of, you know, different avenues you can think. I just don't see that in Paper Tales. That's just me. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just okay. saying for me, I, I don't see it's not as fun as Fairy Tale. That's fair because in our past discussions, you'd basically been saying, I don't feel that there are multiple avenues. 
And I would say things like, well, what about this avenue or this other avenue or this other avenue? You're like, yeah, I'm not seeing it. And that's legit. It is perfectly reasonable for the different pluralities of tactics and strategies of a game that they offer to you to not be the kind of thing that you are inclined to pursue or perhaps even able to perceive in the first instance. And at that point, it's irrelevant, right? It's not, it's not, the, it's not the game's fault. It's not your fault. It's just best to part ways and, and, and go on. Fair enough. It's not that we have to part ways. It's just that I'm not... Well, you said you were done. Well, I mean, I'm just, that's true. I don't mean, <laughs> I, I just mean done as I, as, as I've, I've completely solidified my stance on it. Is what oh, I should, okay. It was what I meant. Well, I said, I will, I will play it if it's the only game being played and I will happily play it, but I will not look forward to it, nor will I choose if it is asked of me what to play. I will never choose Paper Tales. And that is Paper Tales. That's Paper Tales. On, I'm going to talk about, my first game is Food Chain Magnet. We got another game of that in. Fantastic game, and I even I've I shouldn't say because I didn't flip flop on Paper Tales, but I've f- kind of flip flop on Food Chain Magnet. Not that I don't like it anymore, but at first I I wasn't a fan of the milestones, and after that game, I think the milestones are great because in the end, Food Chain Magnet is you have to sell the food to the customers. If you're not selling the food to the customers. It doesn't matter what milestones you have, what advantages you have. If they're not buying your food, you're not winning. And that was Food Chain Magnet. I just employed that strategy of I'm going to be the one that's selling the food. And they went all about getting their milestones, and it was a great game. I loved it. It was a five-player game, am I wrong? It was. And I and were there new players in the game? There was one new player. I was amazed at how quickly you people finished. It was what two and a half hours or so. Yeah, and it was a. Uh, it was a. Uh, I think we went to a long game once the cards came in. Oh, really? The and reserve they, they cards were relatively money. high. Yeah. Wow. No. It, it, look, as we commented, it's a game that has, as I think I commented at the time, it's a game that has, I think, an undeserved reputation for being particularly long and particularly punishing. It's very punishing in a tactical sense because, as we said, if you make a mistake, you are not going to be selling anything, and then Walker will be selling all the pizza, and that. That's exactly the kind of wheelhouse that Splatter is in, right? A, a small tactical error can can reap se- serious consequences, which is why I actually saw this on, parenthetically. I saw this on on a Reddit thread the other day, and someone asserted uh, Food Chain Magnet can't be a Euro because there's too much player interaction, which is ridiculous. I think this is this is just an example of the kind of weird definitions that people get stuck in their heads. Euro means no no player interaction. Yeah, like, yeah, heads down. Yeah. Work your own engine. Nothing else happens. And I'm not going to deny that that's often characteristic of it. But, it's, but you know, to, to my mind, the sort of stereotypical Euro is an auction game. And auctions are entirely defined by player interaction. But anyway, uh, setting all that aside. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad the game went well. And that is Food Chain Magnet by Splatter Games. On the topic of Euros and auction games, played a game of For Sale. This is the filler from 20 years ago by Stefan Dora. It's been published by a bunch of different companies. I believe the current version is being put out by Griffin Games. And For Sale, for what it's worth, is I think pound for pound the best filler game I've ever played. It's an auction game that proceeds in two phases. First you buy properties and then you sell properties. The art is delightful. It has these pictures of various properties that you're buying and selling ranging from a cardboard box on the one-value card all the way to a space station on the 30-value card. And the best feature, as you know from those of us that remember us talking about Hyperborea, we like it when there's little uh, animal details in the art, not because we're especially fond of animals, but we just like little flourishes in the art details. And every piece of property, with the salient exception of the space station, has a visible animal in there somewhere. So we often joke that you're not really buying the property, you're buying the animal that comes with it. Anyhow... This is very much like Paper Tales, the kind of filler game that you can explain in about five minutes, be off and ready to play, minimal setup, very few to no rules questions over the course of the game, really, really, really good tight auction mechanics, nothing groundbreaking, but you do engage in two different kinds of auctions over the course of the game, which I tend to like, uh, very much like another card game that we talked about recently, Amun Ray, the card game, all the very different kinds of games. Anyhow, for sale's been perennially in and out of print for about 20 years, which is an indication of its of its longevity. It's very flexible in terms of player count, even though sometimes seating order can really hamper your ability to do well, particularly in the first phase, which is a not uncommon feature of a lot of auction games, but it is one of the biggest downsides. But I really, really like for sale. If you're in, if you're looking for a, a, a filler that has a, a relatively high level of decision-making capability, but a low barrier to entry, I think you can do a lot worse. 
And it was great to introduce For Sale to a new group of players, and uh, good times seem to be had by all. And if nothing else, you have lovely little artwork of pieces of property at the end of the day. So that was For Sale. My next game is Feast for Odin by Uwe Rosenberg. I know we've never talked about this game before, but it's fantastic. It's funny, because every time I play Feast for Odin, I say, okay, I'm going to finally get an exploration board, and I'm I'm going to like try to increase my score, but it never happens. Why I, do you never colonize? Because, because I just have I have fun playing the game the way it is. Like I don't sure. need this extra stress or this extra <laughs> thing. I, I just enjoy doing it the way. I never win, but I I just doing my little whale hunting or my little raiding and doing my little puzzle over the or the thing. This time though, I did do something different. The bonuses I got all of the bonuses. Usually I just you know you know pave over my whole sheet, but this time I went all out and did super Tetris and it was great. <laughs> Feast. For Odin, haven't played that recently. I should really, I should really give that a play, especially in anticip- well, of course. That having been said, there's an expansion incoming, so clearly we should just stop playing entirely again, until yeah. we. We've talked about this before. It really is strange. The moment an expansion is released, can't play that game anymore. Got to wait for the expansion. It's it's strange. Got to play a game called Pantone the Game. This is by Cryptic Zoic put out this year. It's kind of a party game. It's themed around a company called Pantone, which produces a variety of color systems for industrial design, for commercial design, for color matching. So every color has a code, and so you can engage in correspondence with different people using different software, and everyone is using the same color. Uh, this apparently is a big deal for people who care about things like this. This is all Greek to me. I had to do some manipulation of images for a side project of printing out some expansions on the side, and it reminded me once again why I'm not in any of the visual fields. But uh, just an interesting note of trivia, every year Pantone comes out with a color of the year. The color for this year is ultraviolet, which is code number 18, 3,833. So there you go. Wow. You can go look that up. Anyway, Pantone the game is a party game in which you have these color chips, and you're instructed to basically make drawings, as it were, of various characters from pop culture. So imagine Pictionary, but with paint chips, is the way that I would describe it. Now, the components are nice. The conceit is fine for a party game, but I think that games like this live and die on the strength of their clue cards. The way the game works is you're given a character, and then you're given a series of clues, and after you do your little design, the sooner everyone else, around, uh, anyone else around the table can guess, with the fewer clues, the more points you get, both of you, both for the guesser and the one doing it. So you really need to have good clues, and you really need to have good topics. And generally speaking, the thrust of the clues were clue one is completely unhelpful, clue two is completely unhelpful, clue three is completely unhelpful, and clue four makes it painfully obvious what it is. Uh, let me just give you an example. I had uh, R2-D2, and I did my best. I'm, I'm not blaming the game for my being incompetent at making any, any designs or drawings. That's fine. But I did R2-D2. Clue number one was messenger. Clue number two was helpful. And the last clue was droid. So it's like, okay, helpful messenger from a movie. Sure. That, could, I, you know, that, that describes R2-D2, definitely. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, once Droid comes in, it's like, oh, okay, well, that, that, that cinches it. And indeed, a lot of uh, either the drawing was really good and we, tend to, we tended to get it without any clues or we tended to get it after the last clue. There was very, very little in the middle. And some of the clues were weird, like some of them we found borderline misleading. Anyhow, uh, and it was also the case that the sheer inventory of number of different clue cards in the, the, in the game of Pantone the Game seemed relatively unsatisfying. Like, we went through, in a five-player game, roughly, just a single playing, roughly a quarter of the inventory of the game. That's that's not acceptable. Games like this, you want to have a deep, deep, deep inventory of relatively well-done clues, because quite frankly, you're talking about an activity that can be easily, easily replicated by either number one, half a dozen to a dozen other well-known party games, or number two, could easily be substituted by any number of charades or, or, or publicly available versions thereof. So I thought Pantone the game was cute and the sort of restrictions on the quote unquote drawing was 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 nifty ish, but it really failed on the level of the clue card. So although we enjoyed it, we felt that the the central conceit could have been borne out better by any one of a number of other competitors. And so that was Pantone the game. All right, the last game I'm going to talk about is Great Western Trail. On the on the topic of expansions, I finally got to take Great Western Trail off the shelf where it was, you know, subjugated due to the fact that there was an expansion pending. There was a brief uh, ban put on by the alien overlords. That's right. It's called, This is called Rails to the North. And what it adds is this circuit board to the top of the map 
where you plan out this circuit which sends a virus to the mothership. No. And lets you in. No. Yes, it does. No, no, it's no that's not. No. Yes, you connect through the pathways that look like train rails, but they're really, we know, is circuit board paths for a computer virus. It's what happens. Look right. behind the screen, sheeple. All right, so what really is Rails to the North is this fantastic spa- expansion for Great Western Trail that I won't play without anymore. It adds, it completely changes the top of the board, where now, instead of just, you know, trying to get the most, uh, you know, cow count and working way up the trail, there's this whole rail system now where you can put out houses, getting new bonuses, new abilities, and it really turns the game into a little bit, like I talked to you about before, a little bit like Marco Polo, where you seed the board with all these special abilities, and you sort of have to look at the board at the beginning of the game and plan out what you're going to do. You can't just sort of, you know, wing it, wing it because, you know, you're, you're not going to do well. And the fact that now that we're playing it a lot more, we're changing up where the original buildings go because, you know, it's the recommended at the beginning, but now we're mixing them up. And same thing with your own personal buildings. We're flipping them around and getting all sorts of different combinations with that as well. And it really improves the game. I was waning on it a little bit, you know, slowly going down in my eyes, but this, this, you know, this uh, expansion has brought it way up, and I'm enjoying it tenfold. And you said that the new rules overhead from the expansion is relatively minimal? Minimal, for sure. It's, it's you know, it just incorporates the same sort of rule, you know, get the cows and you get to, you know, place your discs at the, you know, whatever city you want, as long as it's to that or less than that total. And all you're doing is, you know, moving around where those cities are and, you know, getting more abilities. I should give it a try. That's Great Western Trail. Played another game of Root. We talked about Root a few weeks ago when it first came out. I just wanted to comment a bit on the evolving balance state of the game because a number of people have observed that some of the factions are underperforming by a considerable degree, specifically the Lizard Cult, which is one of my favorite factions but is very seriously hampered by a number of things. And it looks like... This is, this is perhaps a bit of speculation, but it looks like what happened was that the expansion factions in Root, namely the Riverfolk and the Lizards, were a tiny bit rushed because apparently what happened was the Lizards were overperforming. They were doing very, very, very well. And then very shortly before publication, they received several nerfs. And so when they went out the door, as a result, they were a little weaker than they wanted to be. Now, the designer Cole World has been monitoring a lot of this discussion, and he's made a number of comments that strike me as... Uh, uh, Perhaps legitimate, but per- perhaps missing the point. He says, well, look, I, I never really intended Root's uh, faction balance to be entirely perfect, which is fine. I mean, no one expects a, a, an equal r- ratio for everybody. But, you know, clearly people felt that it was beyond the pale of acceptability. No one was demanding tournament-level rigor of these kinds of factions. But it, it's not particularly fun if one of your favorite factions or indeed if any of the factions is m- a significantly lower chance of winning straight out the gate. Telling people to self-balance in the context of the game is also unsatisfying because, as we commented, one of the weaknesses of Root is that the game only quote-unquote works when everyone is keeping everyone else in check. And when that level of checking is not dynamic, it's instead dictated by who is what faction, then that removes a significant degree of your freedom. Anyhow, I wanted to flag that the designer has posted a number of, he calls them tournament updates, but really I think they're mostly just faction balance updates that should be applied uh, straight away. If they are successful, I say if because I haven't tried them yet. And it makes the Vagabond slightly weaker. It makes the Lizards slightly stronger. And one hopes that that will, you know, generally give the the Lizards the shot in the arm they need. I'm looking forward to giving a shot, especially with the Lizards. And uh, we'll see how that happens. Anyway, just as a a footnote to the last game we played with Root, I was actually playing a a five-player game with new players, which is not exactly the configuration I thought was ideal. And a couple people at the table seemed to have relatively low levels of game experience, and I was very nervous about it. But at the same time, and we've talked about this before, I don't want to, once people have sat down and said, let's play this game, I don't want to look them straight in the eye and say, I don't think you can handle this. Let's put this away and play Pictionary. That's just not something I'm I'm inclined to do for no other reason than I don't like Pictionary. Uh, But it worked really well. I got to say, I was very surprised. These uh, these new guys picked up to it right away, not just in the sense of how their faction worked, but they remembered, they paid attention to everyone else's faction explanation, which I found in a lot of even experienced gamers, they tend to zone out when I'm explaining how the other factions work, which is not going to lead to a good game of Root. You need to have at least a surface level understanding of how everyone else works. But I was, you know, there was this moment where a, a, a new player, I'd never seen him before, he didn't seem to have much games experience, in around round four... Uh, was looking over at the Birds player and said, oh, yeah, 
And if I, if I manage to rule that clearing and hold it for his turn, he's going to go into infamy and he's going to lose X number of points. So I'm like, wow, this is great. <laughs> you know, he's really figured it out. It was, it was a very, very good experience. And I'm glad that the designer is keeping a close eye on things. I, cause I know lots of other designers who basically say, oh, look, you know, perfect balance is impossible. So screw off instead of saying, well, you know, perfect balance is probably neither desirable nor possible, but there's a community desire for something. So I'm going to do what I can. So in other words, this is another uh, more praise for Cole Whirl. He really seems to be coming into his own. I'm looking forward to his future work and f- further games of Root have been very, very satisfying. So we got Doom Rock back to the table and it was a four player game and we actually won. I can't believe it, but I was there. Which was great. It was, uh, I think it was a combination of the the spawns that we got or the monster groups that we happened to uh, pull and uh, the mix of classes that we had, I think, worked very well together. And uh, I, I, th- I don't think four is the ideal player count, but I am increasingly enjoying my games of Doomrock. It is definitely the case that in, in Assault on Doom Rock, four players is a lot easier than I, I quite realized. Some of my early playings were with four players, but since then it's been exclusively with two or three. And four does make it a, a substantial degree easier. But uh, Walker's entirely right. We got relatively easy monster pulls. I mean, round one was the Exploding Tomatoes, and as anyone will tell you, the Exploding Tomatoes are definitely a better pull than especially, say, the Zombies. We didn't see any of them, which was excellent. And we... Did relatively well on gear, and uh, it's also the case that, you know, Assault on Doomrock has one of those things about, a, especially a co-op game, which is always nice, constantly new surprises. I saw Walker do support role better than I'd seen anyone else do, and I saw someone else at the table do tank better than I'd seen anyone else do. I, I, I said to them before that Assault on Doomrock is mostly a game of pure offense, and I think I was wrong. I think I was underestimating the extent to which a really talented, focused tank and or healer can work, especially in a larger player count game. If you're going to play you know, two, maybe even three players, you probably don't have room for those support roles in the same way, but it really worked. Anyhow, I can't believe it. After all, the, after all this time, uh, after all these playings of Assault on Doomrock, we finally won, and I am 99% sure that it was entirely legit. No house rules, no fudging, no let's back up and change that. We just, we yeah. just played it straight, and we won. No asterisks. That's the best kind of win. Yeah, yeah. Suck it, giant robot. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other thing I love, I love about this industry that we're in or this hobby that we're in is like when you introduce new players or bring in new players, the different strategies they come up with and the totally different way they play a game when you just sort of like look over and it's like, like you're, you're, you're the one that's looking at the game for the first time now. It's like, oh my, you know, you can't believe things are happening. And that's, yeah. that's what I really love about this. Well, that, that's the, and I think that's the mark of a quality game because lots of lesser games won't give you that kind of space or won't really give you those moments. But Assault on Doomrock has definitely been giving that to me as I've been introducing it to new players who appreciate it. So I'm, I'm very glad that it's that it's found a couple of new uh, admirers locally. So that was the games we played this week. And on to the news and why it doesn't matter. This just in, Project Elite has finished up and Asmod- Asmodee, not Asmodee, oh my God. The one company that is not Asmodee. I anymore. know, really. Simon announced that their next Kickstarter is going to be Blood Rage Digital. That's kind of exciting. The other exciting part is their selling point is, guess what? You can get new stuff for your Blood Rage game. That is a fantastic marketing ploy because most people probably can't be bothered with Blood Rage Digital. But if you can get them new exclusive bits for their Blood Rage game, guess what? They are all in with a grin. Yeah, so finally people are going to be able to get Fenris, because as I, as I frequently said, there are two ways you can do the end of the world in Norse mythology, with the wolf that swallows the moon or the wrong way. And so many people have been forced to play the wrong way for so long, I'm glad that everyone else can be brought into the fold. Other news, Bunny Kingdom is getting an expansion. I believe it's called Too Little Too Late. <laughs> So this is going to be another opportunity for Walker to get away with gratuitous jabs at things he doesn't like and for no one to call him on it. But if I dare mention any number of a list of games, it's, it's you know, um, <laughs> Mark won't shut up about these things again. Yeah, I noticed that Bunny Kingdom was getting an expansion. It does not seem to in any way address your criticisms of the game. I, I can't see why it would. I still have, People are enjoying it the way that it is. I, I, re- I really want to try Bunny Kingdom. I really need... There are a couple of people locally who own it. I really need to convince them to, to, to bring it around so I can give it a shot. Other news is there is going to be a new version of Cleopatra and the Society of Architects, a game by Bruno Cathala. It's going to be put out by uplay.it or you play it. 
And apparently it's going to look just as good. But I don't know who's asking for this game. Yeah, it's weird. I feel the same way about this reprint that I did about the Colosseum reprint. These were the sort of middleweight, light light to middleweight Euro management games that Days of Wonder put out that, you know, they showed up, people played them for a while, and then they kind of disappeared. And this was even before the release schedules were as crazy as they as they are now and with you know dozens and dozens and dozens more new games coming out all the time so i'm surprised that they're coming back i i i haven't noticed a real groundswell of desire for them to come back but here here we are i noticed that andrew parks is going to be putting out a new design andrew parks is a designer who uh i continually love to be disappointed by he put out core worlds and i really like core worlds and everything else he's done i have found to be cr- a crushing disappointment but disappointments that are almost always interesting. I don't think Dungeon Alliance was very interesting, but all the other stuff that he's done, Assault on the Giants, a number of other uh, other designs, I, I found stuff in there that was really cool. And his next game is going to be Marvel Strike Teams, uh, which is going to be, you know, themed around Marvel. It's, it's being done with WizKids. It's going to have the clicky bases, the whole thing. Uh, the cast, though, I'm not, a, I, I'm not a huge comics nerd. I'm, in fact, not a comics nerd at all. But given that popular culture consists roughly of 85% superheroes, 14% Star Wars, and 1% everything else, uh, oh, and uh, 120% professional sports, I would have expected to at least recognize the cast. But I only recognized a couple of people that were being presented in the game. There was, uh, you know, Captain America, I'm familiar with him. He's the guy with the shield. And that was about it. (laughs) So... There was some guy with wings and a sword. I'm going to guess he's, I, I mean, I would guess Hawkman, but I don't even know if that's Marvel. That could be DC. Uh, whatever. Oh, you're getting in trouble now. I'm going to get in so much trouble. Oh, man. I shouldn't have mentioned it. I have opened the door now. Uh, please send all your comments to justrolledadice at gmail.com, addressed to Michael Walker. Wow. Your subject line preferably should be in all caps. Uh, so as to communicate the fervency of your... Anyway, uh, so this is going to be Andrew Park's next project. I'm probably going to try it, even though, as I say, the cast doesn't interest me, and I've been disappointed in the past, but as, but I, I, I like trying Andrew Parks' games. So that's uh, that's what's up for him. I have two interesting games I've seen come out of Essen. One is called Little Town Builders. It's done by Studio GG. It's a Japanese company, and it's being picked up by Yellow. I'm not, not fond of... Uh, Yellow's new design of it. I really enjoy the original design. If you want to go to uh, BGG and check out the old art, I think most people agree that it's more quaint than Yellow's. They're bringing into like the same Dice Town sort of oh. motif, which is, yeah, great. And the other game that I've caught my eye is a game coming out by Asmodee. It's called Catch the Moon. It's a yet another dexterity game where you're stacking up these wooden ladders into these grand statues. I think that's going to be another little fantastic gem as well. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now, on to our feature game of the week, which is Claustrophobia. This is because there is a new Kickstarter out now, which is different than... Most Kickstarters that are, that have come out recently, whereas they have just a limited print run, they know exactly how many copies they're going to make. They said it's going to be an eight-week turnaround, which leads me to believe that production is already heavily underway. Yep. And uh, so we'll see how this goes. This is an ins- so. Let's talk about this distribution model first of all. So, fair warning: uh, our timing on this isn't as good as it could have been. We're recording. We're going to be releasing this on the thirteenth of November. Uh, and which basically means you'll have, if you are living in North America, you will have until the Friday of this week to uh, complete your order. If you are in Oceania or Latin America, uh, your copies are already gone. They've allotted a certain amount for various regions. So some regions, they're, they're, the copies have already been sold, and the Kickstarter is going to end uh, by this Friday anyway. It was a very, very short campaign. They're anticipating a very short turnaround. They're expecting fulfillment in January. And this is because, as as Walker said, production has already begun. This is Monolith, and Monolith is now fully using Kickstarter as a store. Which, on the one hand, seems contrary to its original intention. But on the other hand, I at least appreciate how open and transparent they're being about it. Unlike, say, you know, Queen Games, that is clearly using Kickstarter as a store, but still pretends like, hey, get in on the investment, become part of the creative process. No. So, more power to them. 
I, I'm very curious about how this distribution model is going to go. They, they intend to use this for their new projects going forward. They said, look, we don't need your money in advance. We don't need the inf- interest-free loan. We're able to front the money for the, 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 the production of it, but we still want to use Kickstarter as a platform for the pre- free publicity that it offers and for the uh, ability to take pre-orders in this way. So I'm very curious about how this is going. So far, they seem to have no problem selling the copies. They, the initial allotment all told is 10,000 and many regions have sold out several times and they keep re- rejigging things around. But as of this recording, there are still copies available. So by virtue of our enthusiasm for the original game and because of the new Kickstarter, we decided that we would, we would start talking about claustrophobia. True. And on the subject of this, this sales model, at first I was always against, not against this, but I have reservations about Kickstarter, the fact that it bypasses the retailer, bypasses the, the distributor, but with over 800 board games coming out every year, I cannot see how local gaming stores can keep up or how they're even, you know, going to keep this many games on their shelf. So I don't mind, you know, every so often these falling through the hands of the ret- retailers. Well, I got to say, that in the case of claustrophobia, there may be an opportunity cost associated with it because the price point, although not low is certainly lower than a lot of other Monolith projects. See, when Monolith said, look, we we can't do retail, period, for Mythic Battles Pantheon, that made sense because it was a new product line that came out of nowhere overnight with over a dozen SKUs and a very hefty price tag for the base game box. And so when they said, look, we don't think that retailers want this, and even if they did, uh, we don't think it would really work, that made perfect sense to me. But claustrophobia seems more suited to a retail environment. It seems especially well suited even to a demo environment because of how approachable the game is, more on all this later. Uh, so insofar as people have misgivings about retail outlets being cut out, I, I can see where they're coming from, especially with a product like this. But on the other hand, I completely agree with you. This is this is not going to... A couple of titles here and there, especially given that the monolith, namely Asmodee, Asmodee as it currently is, not Asmodee as it was when it first published Claustrophobia, okay, I'm getting confused now, uh, will still be operating through normal retail channels and doesn't use a Kickstarter. I think that retail environments... I'm not going to say they're going to be fine because who knows what's going to happen to game stores in the future. They're not going to run out of product to sell. That's, That's right. certainly something we can agree on. So let's talk about the first edition of Claustrophobia, the original one, the one that we've actually had a chance to play. This was put out by Asmodee back when Asmodee was actually Asmodee before it was the all-destroying consumer of worlds in 2009. And it was published. It was designed by Croc. Croc is the pseudonym of Christophe Réau. And it's very appropriate, uh, just talking about Asmodee in the history, Asmodee was originally founded back in the day as a way to distribute some of the stuff that Croc and his friends were designing. RPGs like in Nomine, Asmodee was sort of a, a, a joke on the name Asmodeus, uh, sort of a Lord of Evil kind of thing, and in, in Nomine is a role-playing game about demons. Anyhow, uh, Croc designed a... He's de- he designs RPGs, he's designed a miniatures game, he's done a couple board games. I first heard of him uh, on the, about the game Age of Gods, which originally published in French, and when it was published, I was living in French Canada. And so when Claustrophobia came out in 2009, I was already paying attention to it because of its design pedigree. And... I remember actually, just as a minor aside, I picked up Claustrophobia and the new edition of Cosmic Encounter on the same day. And that was a good day of retail for me. I, I, I still look back fondly on both of those games and I got them on the same day. Anyway, uh, so Claustrophobia was originally published in a weird sort of coffin box and it was published during a brief Halcyon period where a lot of games came with pre-painted miniatures. And I also have fond memories of those games. I still, I still have my Heroescape collection in my basement. Uh, I'll probably never part with that. I, I parted with some Heroescape. That was a big mistake. Sold some other pre-painted miniatures. That was also a mistake. But for the clumsy among us like me who enjoy painted miniatures, uh, the, the day of pre-paints is sadly, sadly gone. Anyway, Walker, why don't you tell us what one does in Claustrophobia? Well, in Claustrophobia, you can, take, you can play two different factions. Either you're playing the humans or you're playing the demons. If you're the human player, you have two choices. You can keep your eye on the prize... Advance towards the goal, keep the spawning zones to a minimum, and try to lock down the map boards as to keep your men safe, and know when it's time to fight, and know when it's time to run. Your second option is to throw the mission out the window, <laughs> let the cleansing bloodbath begin, <laughs> and all will be cleansed by fire. Then, as the demon player, you need to pick your battles, exploit the human's weaknesses, and wait for the best time to strike. And that is claustrophobia. So it's a scenario-based game with a heavy amount of asymmetry. 
with miniatures. On that basis alone, it has been compared, I think, not completely unfairly to Space Hulk, which is, uh, as we've made very clear, a game we both adore. And when people were making the comparison between Claustrophobia and Space Hulk, even when it was uh, originally being published, that made it all the more appealing to me. And another similarity that it has with Space Hulk is that when compared to a lot of its other cousins, whether it's a similar games by the same publisher or a similar games in the same design space, it is much, much, much simpler. We talked about how Monolith has put out games like Mythic Battles Pantheon, and Claustrophobia is definitely much more straightforward than a game of that ilk, despite its heavy asymmetry. The way I would describe it is basically two parallel dice games that are grafted onto a kind of a head-to-head tiling combat game. Because in almost all of the scenarios of claustrophobia, the key element of the design is that you are building the map as you go along. There's this tiling element where the humans are exploring these tunnels. It's almost never good news for them, but they need to go forward as, as part of uh, the, the the scenario, and that's what drives a lot of the tension, them having to, as Walker says, block all the spawn points as they go step by step. What they did in Claustrophobia is they eliminated all the busy work. You don't need to build the map beforehand. You're drawing off a, a stack of random tiles. Usually, you know, you have to you know shuffle in a couple at the bottom or put one on top or whatever, but it's very minimal, so you're not wasting time building the map you're not wasting time uh counting out spaces on this tile thing because you're moving from one map board to the other map board it's all one movement and it's uh as the demon player you usually have one or two types of demons none of that stuff to worry about it's a very straightforward back and forth fantastic two-player game you're absolutely right a lot of the things that it cuts out I frequently talk about claustrophobia in the same t- context that I talk about Doomrock because it, 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 it really has a laser-like focus on a lot of the elements of games like this that are tiresome and just cuts them straight out. And th- one of the ways in which I'd, I'd like to illustrate this is some of the ways that people overthink the elements of claustrophobia because they've been trained to do so by other games. It is possible in some scenarios because... 99% of the time it's purely dictated by the scenario for one of your characters to be armed with a blunderbuss and the blunderbuss says you have plus one to your combat stat and you're allowed to attack adjacent tiles and immediately new players tend to start coming up with questions okay so when I get the plus one combat when attacking my own tile can I attack into adjacent tile when I don't have line of sight can I attack into adjacent tile when I have friendlies there can I attack in the same tile when there are friendlies there well, it's like, like, you're overthinking it your combat set is one higher and you're also allowed to attack adjacent tiles. You're done. There's nothing else you need to know. That's right. <laughs> you're not, you don't have to worry about splash damage or scatter or anything like that. It's not that kind of game. And I think claustrophobia is the better for it. Yeah. And there's, like I said, there's not this huge list of things you can do. You either attack and then move or move then attack. That's, that's it. You're done. And despite that simplicity, or in fact, precisely because of that simplicity, I think claustrophobia really shines. Because as the human player... And indeed, the asymmetry is more than just mechanics. The asymmetry is definitely in terms of feel. I think Walker hit the nail right on the head. As the human player, you have to mitigate your risk. You have these objectives that you're working towards, and you have to know every time you take a step, every time you build the map, the overwhelming majority of the tiles are terrible for you. And when they come out, and dealing with when they come out is a big deal, but... Every time the map grows, it the, the game gets easier for the demon player precisely because of how spawning works. Spawning is very simple, but it, it informs the tactical puzzle that's going on. On the other hand, as the demon player, you have a certain set of resources available to you, and you really have to know when to spend them. If you spend them at the wrong time, the human player can just stomp them and go, go on their merry way. But on the other hand, if you really know, if you're able to watch and wait and figure out, aha, this is the time when I really want to make my major push, then things can really sing for you. And all of this is layered on top of um, a number of other mechanisms that we'll get to later. But ultimately, all the boring stuff is just completely gone. I, I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I hate counting out squares for movement. I hate counting out squares for range. And I hate line of sight systems. And the fact that claustrophobia is just, eh, move one square. Pfft. The fact there's still a game here and some, sometimes I, I think is remarkable. But I really appreciate, if anything else, the courage of a design like this to be able to strip things down to their minim, uh, minimal essentials and still have a great experience. Right after you said that, I just want to make sure things are perfectly clear because people might think that you're moving one square as in you're literally moving from one one inch square to another one inch <laughs> square. That is not the case. These are giant six by six tiles and you're moving from one tile to the other. You're not just inching your way across. You're moving these fairly vast distances with just one move. So it's sort of abstract. So I want to make sure that's clear. The other thing, 
we're going back to the demons. I just have a line here that just feeds into what you said. It, when you're the demon player, you have to roll either you either a roll with what you got because you're going to roll some dice at the beginning of your turn, and you can get hung up and say, "Oh, I didn't get what I wanted this time," or you can just like build up. So in a future turn, you're going to get what you need. Yeah, a lot of the game again for the demon player is about tempo and is about managing the tempo and knowing when you can be fallow and knowing when you can make the big push. So let me talk about one of the ways in which claustrophobia does get a bit crunchy because, uh, well, compared to its other mechanisms, because it never gets particularly crunchy. One of them is in uh, navigating what's called the blocking rule. And that, I think, is where a lot of the tactical nuance comes in and where the very small inventory of special abilities really starts coming into shine. Because in order to move away from a given tile, you have to have at least as many... Uh, figures on that tile as your opponent does. So if you have one figure on a tile and the opponent has two, that one figure is not permitted to move. It's been blocked, absent a special ability that says that it ignores those things. Conversely, if you have an ability called impressive, nothing can move past you. You just serve as an uh, an insurmountable block unless you have the other ability that, that, that counters that. And normally... In games like this, I don't tend to find that particularly engaging. For example, in a lot of con sims and a lot of hex encounter war games, there are these things known as zones of control, and it impacts various things like movement and attacking. And I tend to find navigating zones of control not particularly engaging. Similarly, one of my big complaints about Blood Bowl was the sort of puzzle-like calculation of zones being threatened and maneuvering this and working from the outside and etc., etc. But because claustrophobia, the space is so stripped down and it really serves to focus on different roles for different characters. The the job of this guy is to be fast and get to where he needs to go. The job of this guy is to stand in the way and block people from getting where they need to go. And I this needs to be a choke point because I need to do these other things with respect to these uh, these objectives over here. I accept the fact that this guy is going to get pounded on because that's his job this turn, etc., etc. A lot of the tactical nuance comes in because of the blocking rule, and I think that the game really sings because of it. Well, the other thing that feeds into the blocking rule is that when you're flipping up these tiles, they each have their own special ability, which also on top of that modifies the blocking rule and it sort of eliminates what all these other dungeon callers have where it's like every time you reveal a new tile or reveal a new room you have to stop and not saying that it's bad that you have to stop and go through the story but the way claustrophobia does it's they do have some times where they have a, a feature space where you have to stop and you know there's a new element of the story but this is you flip over the tile and it has its own little special ability which changes the way the game goes so it just speeds up gameplay that much faster I don't know if you're familiar with this, Walker, but there are people who complain about the size of the tiles in Claustrophobia. There are people who very strongly object and wish that the tiles were, say, even as much as half the size that they currently are. Why would they want that? I don't know either. Now, if you have a, if you have a small table, then Claustrophobia probably isn't for you unless you're willing to play on the floor. I don't normally like playing games on the floor. I'd play, I'd play on the floor for Claustrophobia if someone did that big of a table. The tiles are great. I mean... Could they functionally work if they were much, much smaller? I mean, possibly, but why would you want that? I don't know. Art's fantastic. The art's fantastic, too. We'll talk a little bit more about well, that. Well, I didn't want to go too much. I had I had started to write notes about the art and the miniatures, but seeing as the, like, the new edition is coming out and you can see some of the pictures, I wasn't sure how far we're going to go on this, but the art for the original game is fantastic. The pre-paints are amazing, and uh, I know in the new edition they're going to have uh, different demons. So in this claustrophobia, in this claustrophobia, uh, there's all sorts of different demons you can have as your end boss or as, you know, it can be summoned during the game. And it's always represent, represented by the same figure, which in this type of abstract two-player strategy game, I think is fine. It's like, okay, today's demon is brought to you by the letter D for destruction, right? So, you know, who knows what demon you're going to go against and you just pull the card out. There's different cards for each one, but it's just represented by the same figure, which is fine. I guess they wanted different demons so now all in the new edition they have you know several different demons so now you have to pick through and say oh is it this one compare it to the picture and say no it's this one because it really matters which is fine nothing wrong with it yeah that was another complaint that so people complained about the first edition tiles the tiles have not changed in size uh they've changed in art but we can talk about that later so i'm very glad they stuck to that 
And people complained that there was only one demon figure, which, I mean, quite frankly, first of all, not every scenario has a demon in it. And each different demon tends to show up in only a couple different scenarios anyhow. So the notion of insisting on a different sculpt for each of the different demons struck me as absurd. But, well, when it comes to lots of different sculpts and, and being absurd, that's what Kickstarter is for. So, hey. Yeah, welcome to Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah, welcome to Kickstarter. So, fine. I, I, I guess that's been done. But the art direction of the first edition, I really think, is something special. Because the theme of the game, the theme of claustrophobia is, in point of fact, and, and this is very characteristic of Croc's sense of humor, the theme of the game is that that basically agents of the Catholic Church are trying to colonize vast sections of hell because they found a portal under Jerusalem that sends them to some section of the overworld and a whole bunch of Westerners show up and say, we will colonize this and occupy these territories and the indigenous inhabitants, namely the the, the troglodytes and the demons, are like, hey, you can't, this is, we live here, this is, we can't, and they're like, pay no mind to these foul vermin, we will exterminate them. So, if anything, the demons are kind of the good guys, kind of, sort of, they're at least, they're they're the ones who are being uh, predated upon. And so what we have is a story about demons and about monsters and about the church and holy men and things like that, but it's never grimdark. Because, the uh, first of all, there's a sort of wry sense of humor to the proceedings. And secondly, the art is, I, I would say, more reminiscent of, of, of comic book art a little bit. Bold colors, solid outlines, things like that. And so I really think that it tempers the tone just about perfectly. And the trogs are adorable. I really think that the troglodytes are so adorable, both in terms of the card art and the miniatures. I think it's wonderful. And so you you don't really have... Yeah, like I say, it just starts to differentiate it from a lot of the other games. It's like, oh, hell, and demons and things. like. Eh. It's, yeah. it's comparatively lighthearted. So let's talk about how the game is played a little bit more, because there's some fantastic systems here. At the beginning of the turn, for both teams, they're going to roll some dice. In the case of the humans, they're going to roll a die for every character they have on the board. And for the case of the demons, they're going to roll three dice. The demon's going to allocate it to their sheet, and that gives them all sorts of abilities. Summoning demons, making them do special things. But for the humans... Every human has six different stat lines. And you think at first that they don't vary very much. When you look down the thing, oh, they go up one or two. But once you start playing the game, you can see how these are essential. And so you take the dice that you rolled and you slot them into the different guys. And that's what their stats are going to be for that particular turn. When they start taking damage, this is yet another fantastic system, you start to put these pegs into these different columns. Now... When you roll the dice, if you can't allot them right where you actually have to put a die into where they're wounded, they're going to be exhausted that turn and get to do nothing. So you're going to start blocking off certain stat lines and changing what you can do, and I really think that's a fantastic mechanism. This is actually one of my biggest criticisms of claustrophobia as a game, because the system you're describing, I agree with you. Mechanically, it's wonderful. I think it's great, it's clever, it's low impact. It really, really helps to differentiate the different dice games that people are playing. However... I object to how it makes the game feel because at the start of the game, the humans are as powerful as they are going to get. Now, I'm not. To, this is not a complaint. You know, everything has to be a campaign system. I want my guys to level up over the course of the game. No, 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 that's fine because parenthetically, uh, the human characters consist of one redeemer who is an agent of the aforementioned church and a whole bunch of convicts who have been told either that their sentence or to commute their sentence is to go help the Redeemer clean out these tunnels. So that's another little bit of could be grim dark, but instead is kind of, you know, dark humor or gallows humor. But the humans are the strong, as strong as they're going to get over the course of the game at the start. And gradually as the game progresses, their choice is narrow because their ability to allocate dice goes down as they lose people, they start losing dice. And that's fine in terms of balance and it's fine in terms of an arc. But as a play experience, I think it's a little bit unfortunate because you really do feel strong right at the beginning and painfully weak near the end, which is not exactly how I want the arc of a game to go necessarily. And it can really lead to forced choices near the end. If you're near the end of a scenario and you're at the do or die moment and uh, I'm okay with the do or die moment being determined by a random throw of the dice, but if the random throw of the dice is simply that I cannot activate any of my guys, that kind of leads it into a f skip a turn element. So yes, mechanically it works, but the play experience offered by that is one of the weaker points of the game, I think. True, but what, what it does lead into is uh, the length of the game, right? Because I think for that, it makes the game shorter, and therefore I think it comes in at a per perfect game length. Claustrophobia does. 
I agree. Most of the time when people start talking about scenarios and they start worrying about scenario balance, and this is the, uh, claustrophobia is, is indeed a game where a lot of the scenarios are ridiculously unbalanced by design. Croc has been very open about that. He's like, look, the demon should win most of the time. You know, <laughs> the humans are doing a dumb thing. They should, they should die. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the classic response is, well, then play the scenario twice back to back. And much of the time, even if it's a game that I love, I'm like, I'm not particularly inclined to, to play the same scenario again, either because I'd rather play a different game or play a different scenario. But with claustrophobia, the game is so quick and the setup is usually so minimal that you might as well. We're talking about 30 to 40 minutes here, uh, usually tops, sometimes even less, even less than that, if you're, uh, if, if as the human player especially, you look at your situation and say, eh, I'd rather just call it now, which is a legitimate call because, as I say, you get whittled down. So you're absolutely right on that score. Yeah, that's what I have here too. Swap sides, it's always best to plan to do that. That way, you know, you have a chance to play the demons and the humans, you know, play one side and then immediately swap back, play the same scenario, play it again. Other game elements is that there's a whole deck of equipment that the humans have access to, you know, shields and blunderbusses and all sorts of different things. So that means every game experience is going to be different. There's all sorts of spells and blessings that you can get that are going to mix up the game every time as well. Yeah, some of the scenario design is really good. Some of them offer, some of them are a little overly Baroque, like any of the scenarios that are more than one page long that start talking about, well, when this happens, you have to trigger this other thing. And eh, that, that, that I think is trying to get claustrophobia to do something that it doesn't want to do. But the subtle changes about what gifts the Redeemer has and what little items that someone has, as you said, when you look down the stat lines, they only vary by one number often, plus or minus, but that makes a huge difference. So suddenly the, the insertion of a small item this guy's carrying a shield, so he's a plus one defense. That's a massive, massive deal in claustrophobia. And that really helps to emphasize the difference, the different play experiences you get in different scenarios. All right, so now off to the new version. Let it be said that we only know about the new version from what everyone else can get access to from the Kickstarter page. Well, not everyone else. If we if we were reviewers that matter, we'd have our own copy. That's by true. Now. That's true, but... I don't think any game designer in their right mind would send us a copy of anything. <laughs> Certainly not. Um, so yes, let's start with the graphic design. I, I, I'm wondering. It seems very like it's very different. It's very odd. It's almost reminiscent of you know when claustrophobia came out, like early 2080s. It's very stark colors. It's, huh. like, it's black, white, and red, and it, it just seems very, very minimalistic. It feels. <laughs> Part of this is because it's the same artist that's done a lot of a lot of Monolith's other work, like in Conan and Mythic Battles Pantheon. So t- to me, it actually feels much more contemporary. The sort of very very dark, hyper realistic style. Um, now I agree with you in terms of the the, the physical components, the, the the stark white and black plastic frames into which everything is inserted. It's very strange. It's very harsh. It's it's unadorned. The pl- the plastic is unadorned. So as before, in the first edition of Claustrophobia, you had these little cardboard dashboards that slotted into something. And so it was, you know, mostly full art. Here, what you've got is a cardboard dashboard that you slip into a plastic frame. And the plastic frame is very, very visible. It's It's somewhat odd. Yeah, and even the font that they use for the title of the game, it's just so bizarre. Yeah, overall, I think the... the Every every visual element, I preferred the first edition of Claustrophobia. Now, part of it, let, let, let's be perfectly clear, part of this is that I've been enjoying this game for about 10 years now. Part of this is that it's just photos, and photos are very bad at communicating things like quality of minis and the overall look of the entire game setup and all those other things. But in terms of the drawings, in terms of the sculpts, in terms of the fundamental decisions of art design, I it, it doesn't look like it's, it's, it's for me, really. But these are the kinds of things that you... Humble listener can go and look at. I assure you that one effect, if you never really got on board the claustrophobia train or if you've missed your shot at this new Kickstarter, the new Kickstarter will probably shake loose a bunch of the first edition copies in the secondary market. So you can by all means and and go do the comparison yourself. All right. And it seems as though there's less options for the demon player. We talked about the demon player rolling three dice and uh, you have 10 different options that you can choose from depending on what you rolled. You know, all even dice here, dice over seven here, you know, dice up to 12 in this slot. And in this new game, there's fundamentally less, only six choices now. So that I think is one of those areas where we're going to have to wait and see because 
although it is the case that the board has fewer choices, first of all, there's going to be a secondary board based on whatever demon is in play. In the first edition, the demon just had a stat line, and, you know, if the demon was in play, it did this thing, and if it didn't, it didn't. But now the demons have a, a little bit of, uh, of nuance there, so that's technically an extra option or two. Uh, Croc and uh, the... It should, be, it, should, it should be noted that some of the other design work for the second edition has been done by a designer by the name of Laurent Pouchin, who's done uh, a bunch of games that were mediocre, and one that I think is fabulous. He designed a game called Akko Era of the Asagiri, which for my money is the best miniatures game in a box ever released. With It's got cardboard standees and it's got this beautiful tactical positioning system that really I think is, was done exceptionally well. It was ahead of its time in a number of ways and uh, I should really show it to you someday because I, I think it was it was really, really well done. But anyway, uh, they've commented that they, they took out the four options on the demon player board that were taken the least op- often. But I will say that when used judiciously, I found that those four options could entirely change the tempo of a given round. So yes, they weren't used very frequently. The the, the core the other core options were used more frequently, but they were very consequential. So I you know I share your misgivings, but we'll well we're gonna have to see how this shakes out. Speaking about uh, nuances and change, uh, change has been made to the human player board. Like we said, you roll dice and you slot them in. Now as well as having a stat line, there's going to be abilities and the options to choose cards depending on which stat line you pick. And I thought that was a fantastic idea. That was something that I, I talked to you about in the first place. And you said some of the uh, expansion characters have that where depending on what stat line you have, you're going to have different abilities, not just the stat line, but abilities as well. So I thought that was a fantastic addition. Yeah, so let's spend a minute or two talking about the expansions, actually, because the second edition seems to be implicating a lot of the elements of the first expansion to Cluster. Claustrophobia. Claustrophobia had two expansions to it. It had uh, De Profundis and it had uh, De Fior Sanguinis. And the first expansion introduced uh, a couple new figures for each side. The Hellhounds, which were used in uh, every game of the expansion. Because again, this is a scenario-based game. You pick a scenario, you play that. And the Hellhounds really open up, I think, the options for the demon player. They really influence how dice are used, and they really give the demon player an option for a heavy hitter that's expensive, but often worth it. And that, I think, was just strictly for the good. The two new human figures were strange in that they're only used in a very small number of scenarios. And they were kind of halfway between the convicts who don't ever really do interesting in- anything interesting and, and special unique by themselves. They do interesting and fun things in the game, but they don't have any special stats necessarily for themselves other than a couple of abilities. And the Redeemer, who's often drowning in special toys. Uh, and these uh, these Sicarii, they were called, uh, both of them were kind of halfway between the two. And it looks like, uh, first of all, the, the, the equivalent of the Sicarii are going to be in the base game now for the second edition of Claustrophobia, as well as the Hellhounds. And, although the Hellhounds used to be a little cute, now they're not. Everything that was cute is now... They're, they're horrifying. Yeah, the hell, the new Hellhounds do look genuinely horrifying. I will give them credit for that, although I, I do miss the cute trogs. But it is now the case that there's going to be this new card system whereby you devote special assets to your different human warriors. That, again, is the kind of thing that we've seen pictures and brief descriptions of, but we haven't really seen the, the full range of things so we're going to have to see. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about that because, again, if your squad consists of one guy with a whole bunch of bennies and a whole bunch of guys without... Uh, you know, sometimes that can be a, feel a little bit lopsided. And so trying to spread out the love a little bit is probably for the good. The second expansion, Fura Sanguinis, was not designed by Croc, and it introduced a member of a third faction, all, all of this being based on the sort of general background of the Helderado miniatures game. The third faction just basically represent the uncommitted, the people who have pledged themselves neither to the demons or to the humans, and basically get pounded on by both sides. Uh, it was a giant sort of uh, crocodile lizard man who played kind of like a cross between the demon player and the human player. And suffice to say, all the scenarios I've tried from that second expansion just struck me as wonky. So none of those elements have made it into the second edition. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but less said about that, the better. So if you can find a copy of the first edition, we highly recommend it. If you're inclined to give the second edition a shot, as we say, take your pick. But I, I hope that, se- that first edition copies are going to be shaken loose by this. I'm definitely going to hold on to my first edition copy. I don't know how I feel about some of the changes in second edition, but we'll have to see. Artistically, I think it's mostly a step back, but gameplay-wise, it might have minor improvements. So we'll have to wait and see. But we do definitely love claustrophobia. You actually commented 
uh, last week after we had finished doing our due diligence and playing our, our uh, playing through the entirety of the campaign of Discover Lands Unknown that you were really looking forward to this week because this week we get to play Claustrophobia. That's right. <laughs> something that might actually be fun. <laughs> well, something that we knew to be fun. We, That's right. We, look, like we've, we've, we've both been playing it for years. and yeah. Uh, yeah. Fantastic two-player game. That is Claustrophobia. All right, so let's talk about Keyforge. So Keyforge is designed by Richard Garfield and it's going to be put out by Fantasy Flight. The official launch date is 15th of November. So tell us about tell us about Keyforge well, here, Walker. I, Keyforge is going to be odd. So we all can Oh, it's definitely I odd. I think we can all agree that Magic the Gathering for quite a few years and still now has dominated the collectible card tournament scene. Yeah. I mean, that, saying that it dominates is, I think, underselling it, it right? It is. It's them and then a vast distance before the second place. It's kind of like talking about military spending in the context of the U.S. Like, yes, America dominates military spending around the world, but they also, you know, they outspend their next five competitors, right, combined. I think Magic the Gathering is, is kind of in the same the same stratus. This is also by Richard Garfield. So now Richard Garfield has teamed up with FFG, and he's bringing out another card game that I think is uh, geared towards tournament play. And I think it's and I think they've made it in a way that is more welcoming to starting players. Just due to the fact that everyone's now starting off at the same level. So you know you don't have these mag- magic players that have been in it for 10 years or whatever with these vast collections and the people just starting out have no idea what's going on. Everyone's going to be on the base level. The decks that come out are closed, I guess you could say, closed deck. You can never fixed, yeah. fixed closed decks. You can never modify them. You can never add more cards. You can't change how the deck is played. You play with the same amount of cards every single time. But you can buy multiple decks. You can pick which deck to play. I don't want to say that in a tournament setting. Maybe you can, in that particular tournament, you have to play the same deck all the time. But, I mean, like for now, amongst your friends, you can pick whatever deck you want. And you play with that deck. So now everyone's on equal footing. No crazy, you know, people that are... This happens with almost every game, right? There's always that one person that's super interested, reads everything, learns the game in and out, and dominates in the game. And rightfully so, because, you know, he's put in his due diligence. But now there won't be any of that because it's a set deck. The way they're going to do this, and the way they're going to try to encourage variety is every deck is algorithmically generated before you know they print it out some 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 secret magic algorithm determines what cards are going to be in a deck and then gives the deck a unique name and a unique card back design which is supposed to be a representation of your archon who cares about the theme of this game it's always nonsense to be frank Thematically, that is the only bit that has any traction for me because we've been playing games that are basically Magic the Gathering ever since Magic the Gathering came out. It's like some incredibly powerful entity summons a whole bunch of minions and then the minions smash against each other, something, something, something. And then you come up with some reason why they're fighting and some bit of nonsense. But these, these, these Archon names and these Archon designs are kind of cute. And I do have a tremendous amount of joy in seeing some of the names that have come up. So... It, I think it's in the context of this that we should mention uh, Fantasy Flight's announcement that some decks will indeed be tournament banned. Because all this is supposed to be tracked by an app that's going to be live in a few days. And you're supposed to go in and log your deck and log your wins and losses. And this is supposed to help balance in some nebulous way. We don't know. The tournament scene is going to be whatever the tournament scene is going to be. But some names, apparently, the algorithm spat out things that Fantasy Flight isn't comfortable with. And so Fantasy Flight's going to ban those decks. You're supposed to send them into them and then send you out to, to – they're going to send you two new decks. And uh, would, would you like to talk about some of these uh, some of these weird deck names that have shown up? Uh, it's, it's foolish. What is it? Uh, what's the wizard one? Sorry. I, I, the Loving Wizard. The Loving Wizard. Well, we don't know that that's going to be banned. We have no idea which of these are going to be banned. It's just some of these names are fun. And I, I, I love some of these funny names. Uh, so, so okay, let's talk about the decks that we have. Because we went to a pre list event. We were each able to buy a deck. Uh, so what, what's your deck called? My what? name is Ears Litmus. It's a fabulous it deck title. It's so name. good. I was something... See, the first deck that I saw that was, that was opened up, past the two demo decks that are that are fi- the only two fixed decks in the universe, are in the starter set. Everyone's going to get copies of those if you buy the starter set. I have Hawkrock the Warmaker Goblin. That's pretty standard fantasy, you know, whatever. 
Uh, so I thought it was going to be all like that. But then I saw ears litmus, and I thought, now we're on to something. Because that's actually what's going to drive my purchases. It, insofar as if I'm going to buy other decks, I don't know that I will. But if I will, it's because I'm going to be chasing some of this. So here, here's some of the other ones we saw online. There's The Loving Wizard. There's He Who Unnecessarily Protects Herbalism. That, I think, is a solid name. Titan Flayer, The Farmer of Racism. Now, why would you let your algorithm spit out racism? I do not know. We've also got The First That Vouches for Alcohol. Nice. Well, you always need that in a group, right? Oh, no. What was the other one? Wang the Bruised. Wang the Suddenly Bruised. <laughs> oh, my lord. Here's my all-time favorite, though, of the decks that I've seen post on the internet. The Boy That Basically Headbutts Heaven. That is the best deck. Who could beat that? The Boy Basically Headbutts Heaven, Walker. Now, there's some other ones that have been banned uh, that, I, that I think are very likely to be banned. Uh, Jorvis of 9-11 was an inside job. There's Repnik, Discusser of Abortion. The Zodiac Killer, Ted Cruz. And one which is a little on the nose, He Who Did Your Mom. And so, I, you know, I don't know how those worked out. Now, maybe those last four were, were made up by me. But, uh, you know, I really think that FFG was irresponsible to set up a situation where I could make up these kinds of decks. So please send your complaints to them, not to me. So let's talk about the actual game here, Walker. Well, no, I just want to talk about, much like Simon and their Rising Sun debacle, FFG yet again doesn't do, like, basic diligence. Like, this this seems like a no-brainer. Like, yeah. you go through your dictionary and you take a... Racism, are you kidding me? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think you sit around a table and they say, let's get rid of words related to race and racism. They're like, okay, white, black, uh, a whole bunch of other words. And then they forgot to, you know, cut out race and racism. Um, you know, alcohol also could have been a no-brainer because, you know, obviously there's going to be moral panic about, yes. about that. Uh, you know... <laughs> Which I, which I just think is a is a, a basically bad thing because I, I think lately FFG has been trying to put out new things, in their in their long ago past that's all they did, and then they've got into this you know phase of just putting out reprints and second editions and Star Wars, which are all safe bets, which is fine, but then they try to do original things and they've all seemed to have been failing like Rune Wars and and. Back, it all started back when that was a terrible Mutant Chronicles prepaint game. Oh boy, that was their their you know their their start of their downfall, and they're not putting out original stuff. So I feel bad that I hope this does well for them because it's yet another original game, and I'm hoping that Fantasy Flight finally gets back on the train of putting out all original games. Well, look, I uh, let let let's acknowledge that that there that is not going to be a serious problem. First of all, I think it's more apt to drive purchases than not for for a lot of people who might be inclined to buy multiple decks. Uh, And it's also the case that, let's also be perfectly honest, I sort of had a Mike Walker tinfoil hat type moment. When I first read the release, I'm like, wait, maybe they're just saying this so as to drive more uh, more purchases. It's not impossible, I realize this is a crazy conspiracy theory, but it's not impossible they either did this deliberately or deliberately didn't care about whether their algorithm was going to produce stuff like this because they knew that it was going to generate interest. Everyone's going to be competing for the most hilarious deck name. Now, fortunately, the deck the deck names don't need to be objectionable in any way for them to be hilarious. The boy that basically headbutts heaven is never going to be banned ever, even though obviously it's going to win every game because the boy basically headbutts heaven. Exactly, you can't you can't beat that. You can't beat that. But anyway, I don't know whether that's whether I, I don't think it's likely to be true. I just think that it's possible. Uh, but anyhow, so let, let's let's talk about the game itself. So in Key Forge, you collect Ember. So you can no. Let's talk about the game itself. Screw so you, that. So you can forge, forge keys. keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, all right. Here's the. But wait, that's <laughs> so enthralling and 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 uh, wow, that's yeah, great. Yeah, nobody cares. So every deck consists of three different suits or factions, and on your turn you can only pick one faction to work with, and so that those are the only cards you're allowed to play. Those are the only cards you're allowed to discard, and perhaps most importantly, those are the only cards you're able to activate. So if you've got a whole bunch of creatures out already in play, or a whole bunch of artifacts, there's those are the only there are only three kinds of cards in the game: creatures, actions, and artifacts. Actions are one shots. The other the other two kinds of things stick around. And sure enough, everything taps, although they don't call it tapped. Still can't do that apparently. And so you might be sitting in your hand thinking, well, I want to play these five guys out, but all the guys I've already got on the table are of a different faction. So that tension is, I think, when the game is interesting. And I say when, because that tension doesn't always exist. Your first few turns, 
Uh, and I think you, Walker, made the perfect analogy to another game we talked about before, are not particularly interesting. Why don't you elaborate on that point? Oh, it was just like, as soon as they, they were explaining how the game went, I just went, oh, here we go, Dungeon Alliance all over again, where you look at your hand and it's obvious what you're going to play. It's like, okay, well, I have four of these cards and the rest are all different. I'm obviously going to play this faction this turn because, because that is the best play. Yeah, and cards cycle relatively frequently, which is a good thing. Creatures come and they die, they do their, they have their little moment in the sun and then they go away. So there's a certain fluidity to the game state, which is good. The bad part is, though, it emphasizes or at least increases the number of turns where you're building up from nothing. And those turns are the most boring turns, not only because you're not doing much, but because, as you say, the hand management element is really, really straightforward. What suit is the strongest in my hand? That's the one I'm picking. All these go out. Because nothing costs anything in Keyforge. All cards are free to play, which again is a good feature, and it tends to be where a lot of card a lot of games in this design space have been moving. But when all you have as a trade-off or as a strategic or tactical option is this sort of suit management choice, and very often it's dictated to you by what cards you happen to have drawn, and those cards in your deck are also cards you haven't chosen for yourself, then many of the turns are just mechanical and rote, which is unfortunate. And I'm finding a lot of the plays so far, which are only half a dozen at the moment because it's relatively new, it might fall into a rock, paper, scissors thing against decks. Like this deck is almost always, because of the mechanisms it has, it's interesting that that even though it's computerly generated, some of them definitely have themes and strategies built into the deck, even though it's randomly generated. Like, my is a, like elusive deck. All my guys, you know, can't be attacked. You know, Mark's is this giant generating amber machine, and it seems to have been built that way on purpose. It's not as though it, it doesn't feel as though it's been fall, fallen in randomly. But it looks as though that this deck is always going to beat this deck, this deck will beat that deck. So it might fall into a rock, paper, scissor thing. I'm not sure. It would appear that the different factions all have their set of tricks. You know, there's a there, there's a universe of card effects, and each of the seven different factions have basically a subset of it. This is the armored faction. This is the elusive faction. This is the rush faction. You know, stuff like that. Uh, and by rush, I, of course, mean 2112. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know how the... Even saying that there might be a meta is going to be weird because of the way that the fact, the fact there's no deck construction. I don't know how much depth there's going to be. The problem with a lot of these kinds of of, of games, is, so this is a subset of the two-player card battling genre, right? You have games like Battlecon or Sakura Arms or things like that, where you're a fighter and you're you know you're going and fighting things. But then there's a sort of magic derivatives where you're summoning all these creatures and the creatures come and go and they die and so forth like that, and designers have been chasing the sort of ideal magic derivative for some time now. And it's gotten to the point now where, you know, you can pick one and you'll have no problem with it. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's the the, the slightly more expensive or elaborated ones like David Serlin's Codex, which is kind of cool but very expensive, or, or even the incredibly straightforward, arguably kind of dumb but cheap and cheerful Epic. I quite like the Epic card game for what it's worth. I, mean, I realize it's got its problems. But this design space is so well-tread, and there are so many versions even outside the collectible card game version, that honestly, when it comes to the, 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 the gameplay itself, I'm frequently reminded of, you know, three or four or even five other games that I would, that I would rather play than Keyforge. Honestly, the primary novelty is just that. It's the novelty. It's the fact that there are these weird names and the, 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 the fact that the decks are fixed and you get to see how different decks work and things like that. So... I honestly don't know where to go from here. With, with well, that's what with I mean. That's what, what my key question is: Who is this game made for? Like, it's not made for Magic players. Right? I don't know. No. Well, I, look, everybody who designs a game like this hopes that the Magic community is gonna is gonna like it. Yeah, but the, one of the key elements to Magic is designing your own deck. Is, yes, is is for you know making it your own your own personal way to play, and that's not in Keyforge. There's no collectability. There's no nothing. So I'm not I'm not see how they're gonna pull, pull those guys in, and. And for the newer players, I don't know if they're going to, you know, elevate to this tournament style coming in and playing against new people all the time. I'm not sure how it's going to go. We're going to see. Yeah, in terms of the overall market thrust, who knows? It's also the case they don't even really know how tournaments are going to work yet. Again, because there's no real guarantee that these decks are particularly well balanced, either in general or against other matchups, as you say, could boil down to a sort of rock, paper, scissors situation, which may or may not be the case. One... um, 
the representative of the local store that was running the pre-release mentioned that one possible version that they're that they're mooting with is you play a game against somebody, everybody brings their own deck. You play a game against somebody, and then you swap decks. And then for the if 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 you need a tiebreaker after a, a, after two games, if the same player hasn't won both, you then start bidding on which deck you wanna you wanna play. There's this chains system whereby decks that would do really well or, or cards that are really really powerful give you chains, and that reduces your card draw for a certain number of rounds. Uh, who knows how well this is going to work? But there's a lot of room for 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 different ways to run this. But I agree with you. I'm not I'm not sure what population this is apt to appeal to. Although I think the intent very clearly is to try to get in on some of that magic action. On the plus side, it's relatively inexpensive. Like a single deck is twelve to fifteen dollars, and I don't think that's a huge price point to get in on on playing. You know. You know, you don't need to get the the starter set. You can just buy a deck and use, you know, dice or tokens. You know, it took us two seconds to reach over and grab anything to use as keys and amber and stun and whatever you need. So, so you seem to be reasonably pleased with initial playings, but you had expressed a, a solid disinclination towards giving them any more money. Do you want to elaborate on that? I, I'm going to have to see how many people get into it. Like how, I, at this moment, I think I'm good where I am. And then if it explodes and, you know, a lot of people start playing it and, you know, everyone in our group and subgroups all are starting playing it, then more than likely I'm going to get tired with my one deck, you know, uh, and I'll have to, you know, sacrilege my ears litmus and, and <laughs> go into something something else. Well, the, one of the great things about this kind of setup, though, in terms of not wanting to spend any money is if you just have a small group of people who happen to have bought one deck each, you can just swap them around for a while just so you can try them i you know i'm i'm interested in trying the ears litmus i'm interested in trying the the other decks of 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 people in the local community and you know again it's sufficiently simple to do that i would very much like a deck as awesome as the boy that basically had but heaven but i don't necessarily know that i'll be trying to chase that with every word in that title is amazing (laughs) It's like it's it's not it's the boy who had butts who had butts heaven yeah which would be okay that would be fine but the boy who basically he just basically heads butt heaven it's, it's yeah it's so good it's beautiful it's so good it's, it's it's like poetry it is like poetry it's marvelous yeah so honestly I'm glad it exists right I'm gonna get to see all this, this <laughs> these cool tech names I don't know why algorithms that produce funny sending things are so funny to me but they are and. I, you know, I have no, I have no interest in playing Magic. I haven't played Magic since high school, and if this turns out to be anything remotely sustainable, I have my one deck at the ten bucks that it cost me, so I can participate in that. It's it's fine for a twenty minute game. I'd much rather be playing practically any other two player uh, card game, whether it's a card battling game or whether it's a monster summoning game or whatever. It's definitely you know it's not it's, it's not unpleasant for what it is. It's fine. Uh, but it's certainly very accessible. I should mention that. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, it's easy to teach. Yeah. You know, it's like, like we said, you know, you look at your hand, you say you're going to play this faction, you put out the cards of that faction. If you have some out, they activate all the cards on them. Just say what they do. It's fairly straightforward. Get Ember, attack if you want. At the beginning of your turn, if you have six six Ember, you, you forge a key. Once you get three keys, guess what? You win. It's fairly straightforward. Yeah, I was teaching someone to play. It took me about... I think two minutes before we were we were off to the race, especially since, as I say, the early turns are are sufficiently forced. You don't really need to get into too much of it. You don't even need to explain what the keywords are. It's like, oh, you got four cards from that faction? Play them. I'll tell you what they do. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's hard to it's hard to be too upset about Keyforge as, as it is now. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the meta is, seeing whether there's a tournament scene, looking seeing how Fantasy Flight supports it or fails to support it or things like that. Uh, but mostly I'm in it for the lulls. I'm in it for these uh, these deck names, I gotta tell yeah, you. Yeah, no doubt. And that is Keyforge, a game by Richard Garfield, put out by Fantasy Flight Games. So thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. We read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care, everyone. If you like the show, tell a friend about it. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. 
You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>